So after many, many years of waiting, the day has arrived. Masters of the Air is with you. And I've been really excited about this show because it's rare that we get big budget aeroplane type TV shows anymore. And let's be fair, we've been waiting for this for a long while. So we're going to dispense with sponsors and things like that, except to say thank you as always to the Pima Air and Space Museum for partnering with this show. They're amazing. We're going to be out there in Arizona. And of course, 909 Apparel. Links in the description below. But why should we be excited about Masters of the Air? And this review is going to try to pick it apart a little bit and delve into the show. Apple have been very kind and let me watch the entire series so far. So I'm going to keep it spoiler free. Um, if you've read the book, you know what happened. If you know anything about the 100th, you know what happens. But for those of you joining in and wondering, should I devote nine hours plus of my time to this series? We're going to break it down a little bit and give you some good, some bad. We've been waiting for the show for years and years now, and it's been delayed multiple times, but we have to take it for what it is. So what does Apple say about the show? Well, their publicity notes say this. Masters of the Air follows the men of the 100th Bomb Group, the Bloody 100th, as they conduct perilous bombing raids over Nazi Germany and grapple with the frigid conditions. Lack of oxygen and sheer terror of combat conducted at 25,000 feet in the air, portraying the psychological and emotional price paid by these young men as they help destroy the horror of Hitler's Third Reich is at the heart of Masters of the Air. Some were shot down and captured, some were wounded or killed, and some were lucky enough to make it home. Regardless of individual fate, a toll was extracted on them all. So, the 100th Bomb Group were based at Thorpe's Abbot up in Norfolk, somewhere around that way. It's East Anglia. They're strange out there. And they've sort of gone down as a group that just kept coming back for more. And we have to say from the outset that the losses that the 8th suffered were horrendous. The losses the Bomber Command suffered were horrendous in the strategic bombing campaign. So a lot of people die in this and a lot of people get hurt. So be wary of that. But going in, I need to say I've not read Donald L. Miller's book, Masters of the Air. Friends of mine have read it and there are people who I trust and they were disappointed in some of the comments made about the RAF and their contribution to it. And we're going to come back to that later. So I've come to this purely as a TV show and one that I've been looking forward to for a long while. And I've tried to watch it with sort of three hats on. And those hats are someone coming to it cold, or you can say a Band of Brothers fan, someone who knows Spielberg and Hanks and wants to see what they've done next with their, their war series. I've also come at it as an AV geek wanting big budget aerial TV show. And finally, as someone who knows a little bit about the historic realities of air warfare and the strategic bombing campaign. So short version, if you're one of the first two, you're in for a treat. I think you're really going to love it. And especially if you're just wanting big budget telly with a good looking cast and that's kind of what you want. Or you're a fan of the 100th Bomb Group and want to see the men that you've read about portrayed on screen. I think you're going to be in for a good time. Where it starts to get tricky is if you're in that third group who will look at this a little bit more critically. And, you know, someone who's read about the strategic bombing campaign knows a little bit about the realities of things like the Norden bomb site. Or, frankly, if you, you know, are a subscriber to this podcast, because we've covered this subject a lot, including yesterday with James Rogers and the discussion of precision in American warfare. So we're going to stay spoiler free as much as I can. We'll, we'll do sort of catch up episodes along the way as well and a big recap once everybody's seen it. But we're going to kind of focus on the double header, drop in a few little teasers for stuff that's going to happen later on in the show as well. So what is this thing? Well, 
we kick off and we're introduced to our sort of two initial eyes into the hundredth, which are Gail Buck Clevin, played by Elvis star Austin Butler, and John Bucky Egan. Yeah, they're both named Buck, it's a thing. And he's played by Callum Turner. They're both majors in the 100th, and they head over to England in 1943, with Egan arriving first, and he's the one that gets the initial taste of combat. The rest of the cast, we have the hard-nosed Lieutenant, Lieutenant, sorry, American TV show, Lieutenant Curtis Biddick, which is played by Barry Keoghan, 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 Irish guy. He doesn't like the English very much, We've also got air sick navigator Harry Crosby, played by Derry Girl's very own Anthony Boyle. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we get Derry Girl's representation here. And later on, importantly, we get Rosie Rosenthal as well, played by Nate Mann, who I think is pivotal to the show working. We're going to talk about him a little bit more later. So we basically see the war through these guys' eyes. and They look at it from very different perspectives, I think. And it's what goes into a quite disparate group of men trying to survive in the cold blue. And the episodes that you're going to be able to watch today that are on now, Apple TV Plus, are going to th throw you and this group into combat. There's no Kurahi episode. We don't get to spend a lot of time with these guys before they immediately get into combat over Germany. Now, I will say, if you are an Ernest K. Gann fan, if you've read Fate is the Hunter, there is a bit in the opening episode which will just blow your socks off. I sort of squeed with joy when I saw it. But it's a doubleheader that's very much an introduction to the show. And I think where, say, the Pacific struggled as well and where this will is too is that lack of an hour spent getting to know these guys before it all kicks off. But in these opening two episodes, you're going to get to see two different outcomes. You're going to see the crews figuring it out, what the combat realities of it are, and settling into Norfolk, which, you know, is a, is a thing all of, it, of its own. As the series progresses, you start getting into sort of a mission and episode sort of thing as it jumps forward over the 20 months or so that they're they're here in the UK. And you start following different characters as they're shot down, they're on the run, they're POWs, or coming into Thorpe's Abbot as well to join the fight. And throughout this, Harry Crosby is our, our thread. He does the voiceover. He's the one that introduces the episodes in voiceover, if that wasn't clear, and keeps the threads going together and he sets up the location changes and you know essentially keeps you up to speed with what's going on so what is good and let's start off by the stuff that's that's made me quite sort of happy with the series and that are the two central performances not of Austin Butler and Callum Turner I struggled with them I found them a bit cold and again not knowing too much about the thing the e Egan, as portrayed by Callum Turner, I, I found very hard to empathise with. But the two guys that sort of hold this whole thing together are Anthony Boyle's Crosby and Nate Mann's Rosie. So the navigator and the new replacement guy who comes in later on. And they are the heart of the show. When it stumbles, and it does, Crosby and Rosie bring it back together. And that's sort of just through the sheer heart of their performance the chemistry between the two of them as well in the scenes that they share it's just superb and their character arcs holds the sort of whole second half of the season together and you know they're not the larger build guys i think they're getting a little bit more hype as it's going along and it, it's well deserved everybody's putting in a shift though i'm not saying that everybody it's just them it's a really good ensemble cast with some really good performances. But like I said, there's, there's some that work better than others. And I thought Butler and um, Callum struggle a little bit at times. And that could just be um, the, the nature of it. If we're looking at this as TV as opposed to history, I, I didn't find them as engaging as before. Now, the aerial scenes, much to my happiness, a lot of it is done from within the aircraft. So there's not big, wide tracking shots following a fighter down. We're with the 100th. We need to be in the bombers. And that's what happens. You know, it's brutal. And I think that's to its credits. You know, 
throughout your seeing what happens when an aerial mortar hits the aircraft, when 20 or 30 millimeter cannon shells burst through the sides, what flak does to an aircraft. Let's be fair, this is not a show for the faint of heart when it comes to these things. And that's to its credit, because jagged chunks of metal are not kind to the human body. And again here, this is where the cast does really, really good work. Them being in those confined spaces, they've got the void thing around them, showing them what's going on, like the Star Wars shows do as well. And it helps the performance. And I think those elements on the missions works really, really well. And they do some really inventive camera angles. And the kit is superb as well. The sets and the costuming is top notch, which is, which is what you'd expect from something that's cost this amount of money. What goes on screen is incredible. And you know we're going to come on to the CGI in a bit. Um, we're going to leave that out. But we're going to look at like the physical stuff, the sets. Um, you can see that the money is there on screen and it's all the better for it. You know, the wide shots. And then when you get into sort of the, the bars and the messes and things, the details there are just superb. The thing that also stood out as well is the kiss evolves. So it's not the same guys reusing the same wardrobe. As we get through 44 and 45, you're seeing the new types of uniform come in as well. And I'm sure the boys on fighting and film are going to alley tally that up the wazoo. And it, it looks really, really great. And what more would we expect really? Now, it's always easier to write a bad review than it is a good one. And my initial reaction to some of the episodes were less than stellar. I've had time to think about it. Again, thank you, Apple, for giving me time to think about it, because I think once you've seen it as a whole, it stacks up more. But there's things with it that <clears throat> yeah, have grated with me, and the CGI is one of them. Now, I'm going to caveat this importantly. So I watched this through Apple's press screener site, which I don't know resolution or what compression rates were being done. So if you're going to watch this at home in glorious 4K, it may look a little bit different. I'm watching it through a website in Chrome on a you know, 1440p monitor, probably not getting a 1444k stream. But as we saw in the trailer, some of the shots looked flat. And in what I watched, the aircraft models are very flat. There's a lack of depth to the CG models when they're there. When you've got hundreds of aircraft on screen, and they are quite impressive shots, again, using that cold blue washed out sort of look to it, which I know some people aren't a fan of. I kind of got used to it as the show went on. You, it kind of makes sense when you start seeing it and you start spending a bit of time in it. But again, there is a lack of depth to the aircraft. They seem, you know, when you're a kid and you're drawing an airplane and you draw the wing on the top and the wing on the bottom because you're struggling to get the perspective right. Yeah, it's kind of like that at times. And that depth of field being flattened becomes noticeable and it you know it works a lot better when the shots are through the windows of b17 there's quite a few good shots of people looking sort of over their shoulders or you're over their shoulder looking out of out of the aircraft um there's a great few shots when they're in the p51s later but even still the aircraft models themselves are not great again I could be watching unfinished FX because some of the episodes I had didn't have end titles and things. So it's when those episodes were handed over. You could say, well, this is years late. Everything should be done. Well, it's late for us because we've been expecting it for a while, but there's a lot of effect shots in this. And using that void thing, like we got so used to seeing in Star Wars and things, they're using Unreal Engine, I'm guessing for... Uh, because that's probably the more useful of the, the two. It is very noticeable. Thankfully, because there tends to be a lot going on, and unfortunately poor sods getting blown apart quite a bit, the shots are quite quick. Yes, that slow mo thing does happen, which is terrible, but 
it yeah it just doesn't it doesn't look right at times and that's disappointing i'll leave it up to you to see if you think about it as well but there's 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 other niggles i i had with it um some of the cg bits p51s within the bomber stream i know that kind of did happen but it's always there so you've got there's nobody on top cover by the sounds of it which just um bugged me um they don't drop their drop tanks either which also annoyed me as well and they all seem to have red tails it's like they were reusing models a lot that was odd that might just be me but it didn't look great what else was niggling at me well it's the implied history so you don't watch these shows for good history because you are getting a tv show now when I mean implied history, it's what is the TV show telling us? Now, based on a true story, things we all have to take a pinch of salt. Don't go watch Napoleon expecting it to be accurate. Go watch it. Have a good time. I haven't seen it yet, but some of the bits sound really cool. And in this, what are, what are we seeing? We're going in because we want B-17s. We're wanting hours of Memphis Bell style stuff. And we're wanting to get back into that vein that Spielberg and Hanks have, have created for us, that we want those memories of watching Band of Brothers for the first time. For me, I think the Pacific is superb. People don't like it because of the subject matter. And for me, coming into Masters of the Air, I think this is going to be easier for people to jump into than uh, that was. But for me, kind of the thing that I have is you don't really get anything outside of it. So you are getting the 8th Air Force through the eyes of the 100th Bomb Group. And because of that, you get an idea that the 100th experience is indicative of the 8th as a whole. Now, we have all the episodes about the race 25, 28, 30, all those sorts of things. And yes, I do not want to minimize the sacrifice of the 8th, or Bomber Command for that matter. I would not want to have had to do that. I would not have lasted long. I would probably have been lucky to have made a gunner. But because you are seeing it just in this one group, you are also not seeing anything being reflected onto the effectiveness of this group. There's no time discussing how they fly formation better. There's no shots on the ground of them needing to fly tighter and closer because that means by extension they'll be safer. There isn't any of that. There's scenes where they're trying to get everybody to close up in the air, but that's it. It's not really mentioned again. And then just loads of guys get shot down. There's also the matter of precision, which we discussed on yesterday's pod with James Rogers. At no point throughout the show, ever, do you actually know whether or not the 100th are hitting their targets. They're shown to be hitting them. And if they can't, they turn back. It's the Memphis Bell problem of, you know, we've got to put the bombs in the pickle barrel. There's a school over here, all that sort of stuff. Oh, it's in the heart of Berlin. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Those objections might have been raised, but the 8th Air Force conducted an area bombing campaign during daylight. We have to get used to that as fact. This show doesn't do that. There's one shot of uh, one of the Berlin raids where you're looking through the, the, the bomb site. The guy's dropping his bombs. They're all landing in the pickle barrel. Goes to a wide shot as the 100th guy drops his bombs. They're a long way away from the target. So those bombs were not landing anywhere near whatever it was they were going after. There's no mention of the fallibility of the Norden bomb site. It's this wonder weapon they make a big thing of crews shooting it when they're going down. It's not great. And then you get to anyone who's not American. And we're back into Spielberg world here. And throughout the whole thing, the British are shown as either arrogant caricatures, evacuee street urchins straight out of central casting, or something to be shagged. And that's kind of about it. There's a scene in the pub where our lead guys in the early one, this is in episode two, sit down with some RAF guys. They call one of the RAF guys captain, even though he's quite clearly a flight lieutenant. And that conversation is an opportunity to show 
nuance to show the difference between daylight and nighttime bombing operations. And this is sort of 43. So Bomber Command has Pathfinders. They've got H2S. They've got G. They've got a lot of things going for them that the Americans wouldn't take on for a while. And yet it's... You can, you can watch it and let me know what you think. But it's a very poor scene when it could have taken a few moments to educate everybody and they don't do it and John Orloff who I really like as as a writer he unfortunately plums for something that he could have pulled out of Malcolm Gladwell it's it's not good um and it's 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 something that drags you out of the episode if you're not American and you're not bought into that rhetoric yeah, it's, it's just disappointing. I got to speak to John a couple of years ago and he talked about the amount of research that was gone in to make this right and the lack of nuance here and in a few other places as well doesn't allow the show to elevate itself to a new level. And it's just a little bit of effort that could have been thrown in, but all the effort goes into American exceptionalism in this case. Now, my last criticism is... Jumping ahead a few weeks, that's episode eight, which is where the Red Tails show up. And we have to give a serious shout out here to Brandon Cook, our very own new Doctor Who in Nakuti Gaswa, and Josiah Cross. And they played Second Lieutenant Alexander Jefferson, Second Lieutenant Robert H. Daniels, and Lieutenant James Douglas, respectfully. These guys are superb and they bring gravitas to the men that they're playing. And that is exactly as you would expect for guys playing Tuskegee Airmen. They are given scraps to work with and they do a phenomenal job. And we're going to do more about that when we get to episode eight. I'd heard rumors about how the episode was structured. And I was really, really excited for it. Unfortunately, it's a token edition and it lands straight upon the producers and upon their heads, be it. We still have to wait for a proper spiritual successor to HBO's Tuskegee Airmen, and it's been nearly 30 years now, and we still haven't got it. This was an opportunity. To be fair, this yeah, whole series should have been about the 332nd, not about the 100th, but it is what it is. And yeah, that's just, you know, in my notes, I just put if Spielberg and Hanks had had the cojones they would have made this about the Tuskegee Airmen. And I think it would have been better for it because you could have done the, you know, the fighter pilots, the bomber pilots, you could have had so much more um, to do. But there we go. That's just me wishful thinking, wanting a decent red tail show. But when you get early access, let's wrap this up. So when you get early access to something, it's, especially when you're super excited about something, and I am for Masters of the Air, you always have to temper your expect expectations a little bit. And I remember bribing Radio 1's Ali Plum to get me into the press screening of Mad Max Fury Road. And it was <laughs> a Big Lebowski bowling ball that you unscrewed and it was a DVD. In that, I saw film critics standing up and cheering. And going back to my three hats for this review, I think the majority of people will really like this. I don't think there's going to be standing up and cheering. And I think this is going to do phenomenally in the States, especially in an election year. I think it's going to be lapped up by a lot of people and a lot of people who are very much enamored with this sort of thing and with the American story of the Second World War. I think people are going to love it. I think for watchers of masses of the air outside of the US and outside of an Amerocentric bubble for this sort of thing, there's going to be a lot more pushback. And I think episode two and the episode in Stella Look Three, when they hear about the Great Escape, there's a lack of empathy there and there's a lack of nuance here. And it's a shame. And I think the, the, the good old AV geek community is going to be divided about it. I think the, the CGI issues people are going to bitch and complain about for a long time. But regardless of that, where are we? And all three hats on as someone who's watched the whole thing. It's a very slickly made TV show. And it's up to the production standards that Apple have set. And, you know, while I was rather cold on the performances of Austin Butler and Callum Turner, I was blown away by 
Anthony Boyle and Nate Mann, and they're the standouts of the show. And you know, Anthony Boyle has had quite a career so far. Nate Mann's the new guy, and I think he's going to be an absolute star. And the heart that he brings to Rosie Rosenthal, especially in the last couple episodes, this is his breakout. And if it is, all the more power to his elbow for whatever he does next. Is Masters of the Air what I hoped it would be? No, not at all. Does it stand on its own despite my niggles and gripes that I've been going on for, for 20 odd minutes? Yeah, it does. I, I think it's, it's, it's good TV. Let's just put it at that. Is it the historically nuanced sort of thing? No, it was never going to be there. What we've got is a Spielberg's and Hanks TV series about airplanes. If you've watched Band of the Hell, you know, the whole can scene in Saving Private Ryan, their stall was set out then. But I, we've got a big budget airplane TV series that has a number of phenomenal scenes in it. Some episodes work better than others. Some of the performances are great. Stuff happens that makes you go, oh, which is what you want. And there's some very uncomfortable moments in it. Some handled better than others, but there we go. Don't start comparing this one-to-one -to, -one to Band of Brothers. There are two very different things. Let them stand on their own. Don't treat them as equals. Um, I think there's things in this that are lacking, but it's still big budget airplane TV show. You know, I hope it's a hit because if lots of people get behind this and love it, that means we could get more. And that could mean that there's a producer sitting somewhere with a production deal who's picked up a copy of Bomber or wants to do something with the Tuskegee Airmen and he can go, Masters of the Air worked or Masters of the Air hit. Apple TV got a massive bump in subs. Why can't we do that? Because look at this Len Dighton novel or look at the story of these incredible African-Americans. Let's do that. Yeah, we can, but hope. And that's what I kind of came out with. I, there's going to be a lot of people piling on. There's a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon. I did see Max Hastings in the Times getting his name out there again. Max does Max. But I didn't stop watching it. I wanted to see what was next. And again, that comes down to Boyle and Man. I think they were fantastic. And you should watch it for the work that those two actors do, because it is absolutely superb shout out to bell poli as well whose agent is clearly wired in at apple <laughs> well done for her the important bits the first two episodes of masters of the air are available today now on apple tv plus you get a free seven day trial if you sign up and it is eight pounds 99 in the uk a month or about six bucks 99 cents in the states now sign up for masters of the air watch this Stay for All Mankind, which is Ron D. Moore at peak Ron D. Moore. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Final notes. Yeah, it's all right. It's not great. But there we go. Big budget airplane TV show. What more can you want? Thanks so much. Until next time, do take care of yourselves. Check out Pima Air and Space at 909 Apparel. Bye-bye.